Every year, in a field in Cornwall, they gather to commemorate the last battle of the greatest of all British heroes. The tales of Arthur have got it all. Love and courage, betrayal, and the ultimate spiritual quest. This is a search for the legend of King Arthur, a journey through Celtic Britain, France and Ireland. It's a story of ancient alchemy and medieval mysticism. A tale of a lost golden age which one day will return. And more than that, Arthur's story, so the Celtic bard said, was the matter of Britain. The legend of King Arthur has been told by poets and filmmakers for a thousand years. How the pure knighthood was destroyed in the end by adulterous love and the horror of civil war. Merlin! Where are you? It has immortal characters and imperishable symbols. The Holy Grail, the Round Table and the Magic Sword, Excalibur. Our search for the legend of King Arthur begins not in the Isle of Avalon or in Camelot, but here among the canal barges in an industrial suburb of Oxford. It's rare that you can pinpoint the exact time and place in which a myth gets created or reshaped by a great storyteller. But in this case, we can. This, believe it or not, is the most important place in the creation of the myths of King Arthur. Just come and have a look at this. Isn't that brilliant? This is all that's left of the 12th century abbey on Osney Island outside Oxford. It was here, in 1129, that a young Welsh cleric became the most influential, the most brilliant and the most imaginative creator of the Arthur myth. His name, Geoffrey of Monmouth. It was right on this spot that Geoffrey created an imaginary history of the Celts as the Celts might have dreamed their history could be. Here for the first time are Merlin and Guinevere and the wicked Mordred, the betrayer of Arthur. Here's the prototypes of Excalibur and Camelot and Avalon and at the centre of it Arthur himself, the once and future king. But when you think of Geoffrey's Arthur don't think history, think storytelling. This is a kind of dazzling medieval infotainment in comparison with which mere historical fact is simply boring. Now Uther Pendragon was Lord of Britain. He held a great feast and among those present was Gorlois, Duke of Cornwall, with his wife. Igerna, the greatest beauty in all Britain. When the king cast his eyes on her, he fell madly in love. Her husband, discovering this, retired angrily from the court. He put his wife into the castle of Tintagel by the seashore, 
a place of the greatest safety. Then King Uther said to the wizard Merlin, My passion for Agurna is such that if I do not possess her, I will go mad with desire. And Merlin said, I have a magic potion that will make you appear the exact likeness of her husband, and you can go to her. The king drank the potion, and he went to Tintagel, and he was let in. And the king stayed all night in Agurna's arms, and he made passionate love to her. For she was deceived by Merlin's magic. And that was the night Arthur was conceived. Great myths need great locations, and the Dark Age fortress at Tintagel in Cornwall simply begs to be included. Here, Geoffrey heard folk tales about a Celtic hero, Arthur, who would one day return. We know that Geoffrey was writing the 1130s, picking up various stories around the country, and that he was somehow induced to visit Tintagel. And his description, when we get on to the question of Arthur's uh, conception by trickery, makes it perfectly clear that he was here. All we're told is Arthur's conceived here. Uh -huh. The assumption is he's born here. Yeah. After that, yeah. one has to say, in the history of the Kings of Britain, Arthur doesn't have anything more to do with Tintagel. But that was sufficient to spark it off. Somehow, a whole series of beliefs is brought together by this genius, this romancer, this, yeah. uh, this Geoffrey Archer of our, our, our <laughs> period. He, he was. It's, a, it's a wonderful book, the historian. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah, and it's brought here. But Geoffrey's Arthur wasn't just a good story, it was a political weapon. His prophecy that Britain would rise again could be used against the English oppressors. The Celts needed a hero, and Geoffrey provided him. King Arthur represents the Celtic spirit for, um, for bards and, and the people of Cornwall. And therefore, when we all cry, Ninju Maro Michten Arthur, um, essentially it's uh, expressing the fact that the Celtic spirit um, is not dead in this country. Every year, the Celtic bards meet here in Bodmin, speaking the ancient British language of Cornwall. Atoma Clether, it's in Lay Kalispoch. Clether Mixtern Arthur. Swearing on Arthur's Excalibur, their independence from the English. Ninju Maro, Mixtern Arthur. King Arthur's not dead, but at least not in spirit anyway. And the sword represents the spirit of Arthur, who defended Britain as, it, as we diminished westward in the onslaught of the Anglo Saxons many thousand years ago. But the idea of Arthur as a resistance hero against the English was far older than Geoffrey. In the Roman Empire, Britain was the jewel in the crown. When the Romans left, it was coveted by the barbarians, especially the Saxons, ancestors of today's English, who sailed across the sea from Germany. According to later legend, the Saxon invaders were first welcomed by the British ruler, the tyrant Lord Vortiger. The Anglo-Saxon tradition was that the first landing of the Anglo-Saxons was at a place called Ipwinus Fleot, which most people say it's Ebbsfleet. Where, where's Ebbsfleet? Well, Ebbsfleet is just behind the power station to our starboard side. <laughs> <laughs> it 
It all looks like some nondescript backwater 21st century Britain, doesn't it? But this is the scene of perhaps the most momentous events that ever took place in the history of the British Isles. We're in one of the marshy channels between the Isle of Thanet and the mainland of Kent. And according to legend, it was here in the year 449 AD that three ships came sailing up under the command of two pagan Saxon chieftains. Their names were Hengist and Horsa, the stallion and the horse. Hengist and Horsa, so the legend goes, were hired as mercenaries by Lord Vortigern to fight for him. Unwisely, perhaps, Vortigern gave them land as a reward, but the Saxons soon turned against him and took more for themselves. A foothold in Britain that would become England. In the heart of rural Kent, this reenactment group are recreating that ancient English past. They're building a Saxon long haul. For Kim Sidorn, it really is a dream come true. Isn't that amazing? So it's like the great medieval barns in a way. It it's is the same, very much same so. idea, I suppose, yep. is it? And the, the woodwork is very similar. The hall will be accurate in every historical detail, but it will also embody an English myth. Where's the fire? You're standing in it, basically. There will be a long fire running up the centre of the building, yeah. perhaps 12 feet long or so. And for many English people, that myth arouses emotions as strong as those felt by the Celtic bards in Cornwall. But then, the English were the winners. Athelstan, Cuny, Eorl Grichten, Birna Biagifa, and his brother Eak, Edmund Atheling. On this island. This poem was written over a thousand years ago in Old English. Sweordus Edgum, Sithen. Engle on Saxon. It boasts of the coming of the Saxons and their conquest of the Britons. Britaina Sochtan, Ert begetten. Angles and the Saxons, you can almost hear it in modern English, can't you? Since the Angles and Saxons came over across the broad waves, Ofer Brad Brimu sought out Britain, Britaina Sochtan, and took the earth. Ert begetten. Amazing, amazing, isn't it? England. England is an idea that has lit the world for a thousand years. The land holds the bones of those who died for it. England is still an idea and an ideal um, and is, is held, high, uh, held high in the hearts of many of us. And I speak for ordinary people as, as, as well as nuts like us that seek to recreate this period. And it was in response to such tales of Saxon victories that the Celts created their own hero. Arthur, the Lord of Battles, fought for the kings of Britons against the Saxon invaders. He fought 12 battles, and he carried the image of the Virgin Mary on his shoulders and our Lord Jesus Christ in his heart. In his 12th battle on Mount Baden, 960 Saxons fell in one day from one charge, and no one struck them down but Arthur alone. And in all his wars, he was the victor. By the time that tale was written in the 9th century, the Celts, or the Welsh as the English call them, had been pushed to the corners of the island 
still railing against the man who had betrayed Britain. Vortigern, having fled from the, uh, the Saxons that he'd invited into the country to help him with his battles, was advised to build a castle in one of the strongest places in the island of Britain. And he came here, but unfortunately, Every time his workmen returned to their labours, they found that the stones were scattered all over the place and they weren't able to build the castle. His advisers, his, uh, his counsellors, told him that there was a curse uh, that uh, made it impossible to build anything. And the only way that you could break that curse was to find a golden-haired boy whose mother could confirm that there never was any father and to kill the boy and sprinkle his blood around the summit of the hill. The boy led Vortigern to the top of the hill, here at Dinas Emrys. Under a stone pavement, he revealed a great jar. Inside were two dragons, one white and one red. The dragons fought each other until the red one triumphed and the white one fled. It was a prophecy, the boy said. One day the Celts would overthrow the Saxons. A hero would appear and Britain would rise again. And this is supposedly the exact spot where it happened. When the archeologist that was working here in the 1950s, Doug, indeed he did find a pavement exactly where you'd expect to find it. Yeah. I don't suppose it's possible this really was the fortress of Vortigern, is it? Well, that's another <laughs> suggestion. Maybe, maybe there was a fortress here. Maybe there are dragons still here. <laughs> Spared from death, it was the blonde boy who prophesied the return of Arthur. And the boy's name? Merthin, or as we know him, Merlin. But to the Welsh, Merthyn is also one of their first bards, and today's Welsh poets still claim his inspiration. The image of Merlin we have today is a bit like kind of Gandalf in Lord of the Rings, isn't it? But who is the first Merlin? He was a uh, court poet in the north of England uh, when the whole of Britain was British Welsh. He becomes a kind of a seer, but not a wizard. I mean, he doesn't go to change to people with frogs tricks. and stuff. No. But he does have this power to see things that other people can't. Yeah, he's, and, uh, uh, he's more of a prophet than somebody who pulls rabbits out of a hat. For example. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Oh. And uh, the oldest poetry that survived talks about him in the wood with his piglet. He speaks to his piglet like a familiar, in a way. And uh, there are long pieces of verse, half of which are factual and historic and half of which are just ranting wow. about different things. And these yeah. verses survive? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Can you do them? We, we can do some now. Oh, yes. Can no we uh, refer to our book? Yes, we of course, of course. Yeah. 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 He says, I am Merlin, the king of prophets. And uh, the I loudly Merlin, the king of prophets. And I loudly proclaim and since I am Merlin, uh, prophetic words pour from my mouth like the best wine. Gwn ddyfnder pob llyn, rhif plu a derin, pam na fydd sgodyn yn rhoi sgidiau, which is, I know the depth of every lake, the number of a bird's feathers, why fish go unshod. Gwn uchder seran, lled y ffyrf afen, pam y bydd pen yn llaw yn poenau. What does that mean? It means I know how high a star is, and I know how wide heaven is, and I know why minds are troubled. So it was through poetry and prophecy that Arthur first came into being. But it was Merlin's magic that made him not just a warrior, but a king. On Christmas Eve, when the nobles of England came out of church, they saw a great stone with an iron anvil into which a sword was fixed. And on the sword blade, inlaid in gilt, it said, whoever takes this sword out of the stone shall be king. And all the worthiest lords tried, and no one could move it. 
Then young Arthur happened to ride up on his horse, and he saw the stone. And he leaned over in his saddle, took the sword by the hilt, and drew it out. And the archbishop said, Here is the man that God has chosen, as you have all seen. And that was the way Arthur became king. And that story shows how Arthur begins to attract other tales, like a magnet. Hi, Neil. Hello, Michael. Hi. Oh, so this is it. Cool. Yeah, this is a simple charcoal furnace we're using today. Take a seat. Thank you. That's it. You just go left and right. That's great. The sword in the stone is one of the most famous of the tales of Arthur. You can go a little bit slower. But this part of the legend may come from much more ancient times. Back in the Bronze Age, this was an absolutely magical thing, as well as a, a, a dramatic technological innovation. The smith is somebody who transforms base metals into something beautiful and extraordinary. Neil Burridge is a bronze caster, and he's worked out the ancient technique of casting bronze swords in a stone mould. <laughs> we get rid of some of this charcoal on the top. Can you see? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow, look at it inside. We go this way. Okay. And, then we, and we pour? And we pour. There we go. Right, you can talk. Yeah, is that it? That's it. We can tell it's set now. Because it's not it's oh, not yeah. moving. Oh, so yeah. let me use this. Push the middle, oh, we yeah, can yeah. tell it's yeah. set. Right. So now we're gonna lay it down. Yeah. Nice the mould apart. <laughs> so we've got a, a nice casting. God, See? Look at that, that's absolutely amazing, isn't it? Yeah. It is magic. So there's the sword in the stone. It's amazing how quickly you've got a weapon, isn't it? It's, it's almost instant. That's a technique from the Middle Bronze Age, about 1000 BC, but you can see how a process like that was the kind of thing that could be remembered by the bards and the poets and handed down. Maybe the story of the sword in the stone is a, a hangover of that ancient past. By the late 12th century, Arthur had become a rallying cry for Welsh revolt, and the English began to see him as a threat. According to Geoffrey of Monmouth, Arthur's last resting place was the Isle of Avalon, Glastonbury. The Lady Chapel starts at that arch there, does it? Is that right? <laughs> and here, the English king, Henry II, decided to prove that Arthur was dead and could never come back. And how many paces? Um, about 14, 15 paces. 14 or 15 paces. Clues in medieval chronicles allow us to piece together what really happened on Britain's first archaeological dig. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Round about here is the tomb. Yeah. When they started digging, they put up a pavilion around the spot so that people couldn't see what they were doing. They screened it off they like a kind of police off. investigation. They they just like a police investigation. <laughs> and, and Gerald of Wales said that they went down 16 feet. Okay. And what did Gerald say they found at the bottom of the hole then? Um, a large hollowed oak coffin with two skeletons, one of Arthur, one of Guinevere. 
This is the page from Camden's Britannia, and this is his drawing of the of the cross. Hic jacet in clitus rex Arturius in insula Avalonia. Is that suspicious? I think it's very suspicious. <laughs> I think it's suspicious partly because we're talking about like the famous King Arthur. Yeah. Like King Arthur doesn't become famous until long after his death. And yeah. the lettering's wrong as well, the lettering's 12th century. Oh, is it? Yes. <laughs> I have too so much. So they've given yeah. themselves away. So there you are. The 1191 excavation of King Arthur's body here at Glastonbury, without a shadow of doubt, was a fraud. But it sparked off an explosion of interest in the legend. Given a fine new tomb in Glastonbury, Arthur became a huge tourist draw. Meanwhile, his legend went international. Henry II's French wife, Eleanor of Aquitaine, hired French poets to write new Arthur myths. Their Arthur was a courtly hero of the Age of Chivalry. The former Welsh guerrilla was now head of the most glamorous court in Europe. And what better place to imagine it? Towering ramparts, fairy tale turrets, monks and nuns, knightly halls. This is how the medieval romances picture the world of King Arthur. The Bretons are also Celts, cousins of the Cornish and the Welsh. Bertrand Vinton does tours of the Breton Arthurian sites. We're heading to. Um Little island over there, Tom Miller and his mother. How far is it? About a kilometer? Or? No, it's about three kilometers yeah. from here. Like it's, right. it's really tricky. You think it's so near, and it's kind of distance. Here in France, Arthur became a kind of medieval Superman who slew monsters, rescued maidens, and fought giants. So um, the stories of Arthur, Arthur, and Merlin, Merlin, yeah. they are well known here in yeah. France and Brittany. Yes. Yeah, wow, well, yes. amazing. Now, there is a British legend that is uh, about Tom Merlin. Arthur came here and, and killed the giant. Yes. Is, is this story also here? Yes, that was an ogre who came from like Spain, this one. An ogre who came yes. from Spain? Yes. Oh, wow. He was Fantastic. huge <laughs> and he used to live in the, this island of the Mont Saint Michel. Yeah. Arthur was on his way to Rome. He heard that he was a, a princess who was like in trouble with that ogre. So he decided to come to the rescue. Arthur killed the ogre, but he was too late. Princess Hélène was already dead. Breton legend says he buried her here on the island. Here we are, all the way to the top. Facing the Mont Saint Michel. And so Brittany became another Arthur country. And what a human thing it is in places of such breathtaking beauty to create wonderful story and tie them to real landscapes. That's how myths grow, crystallizing our dreams. And it was here in France that medieval dreamers now made the tale of Arthur and his knights a focus for the spiritual values of the age. But of all the writers who reinvented, reimagined Arthur in the 12th century, the greatest was Chrétien de Troyes. Chrétien took the legend onto a whole new level of romance and chivalry and spiritual quest. And in his last work, he added an amazing twist, a wonderful theme which has captivated the world ever since. A young knight, Sir Percival, arrives tired and hungry at a magical castle. From here to Beirut, says Chrétien, a more beautiful castle 
could never be seen. But a dark threat of war and suffering hangs over the land. Percival is led into the hall and there is seated as if for a feast. And he watches in silence as a vision unfolds. came in, holding a white lance, and he passed in front of the fire. Everyone in the hall saw a drop of blood issue from the tip of the lance, and the red drop ran right down to the boy's hand. Now a girl came in, fair and comely, and between her hands she held a grail. And when she carried the grail in, the hall was filled with a light so brilliant that the candles lost their brightness as do the moon or stars when the sun rises. And Percival went to sleep, longing to know the meaning of this vision and who is to be served from the grail. When Percival woke, the castle was empty and the grail was gone. And a quest began that has fascinated writers and filmmakers ever since. A grail is a serving dish, but it soon became the grail, the cup used by Christ at the Last Supper. That's a sweet place, isn't it? The tale invented by Chrétien came back to England and okay. soon spread to the Welsh this borders. It. This is it. Yeah, yeah. What am I on camera? <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> and here they say if you want to find the Holy Grail, the key, or rather the keys, are kept in the Hodnet village shop. Hi, Janice. This is Hi, Michael. Janice. Uh, Hello. Nice to meet you. Whole crew. Sorry to disturb you. Can we, borrow, right. can we borrow the key for the church? Yes, you certainly can. Go here. Now, Brilliant. it's a bit complicated. That's the outer door. Okay. You go into the little door in the corner. Okay. So that's the outer door, upper lock. Okay. That's the inner door, upper lock. And the inner door, bottom okay. lock. Thanks very much. The Grail story appears in a 13th century Shropshire legend. And it resurfaces with a Victorian antiquarian, Thomas Wright. Was he left um, a series of clues within the poem? Finally, brought you to this church. Graham Phillips has spent years trying to untangle the riddle. He thinks that Wright left clues to the whereabouts of the Holy Grail in the west window of the village church. Oh, there it is. You can see that the four figures represented are supposed to be Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, um, although John quite clearly is a woman in this representation, perhaps Mary Magdalene. And obviously with the, the, the cup being called the Marian Chalice, the chalice that was supposed to have been used by Mary Magdalene to collect Christ. At the crucifixion, at the crucifixion. she holds the cup up to collect the blood of Christ. Yeah. So what, what led you to this? A family called the Fitzwarren family uh, possessed a cup which they claim was the Holy Grail. Mm. Their descendants were called the Vernons and their descendant was Thomas Wright, the man who had this stained glass window put in. So, the, the plot thickens yeah. here. He claims to have the very same cup, but he's got no son to hand it on to. No story has generated so many conspiracy theories. But that's a testimony to the seductive power of the myth and its symbols. And if one of those statues has to be the one that's important, it must be the one that's above St John's head, the eagle statue. The Shropshire Grail mystery leads to Hawkston Park. It's an 18th century fantasy garden, which has now become another Arthur country. Only this one was made to order. In this man-made grotto, 
the mischievous Victorian Thomas Wright left a final clue. Right. So these are the two statues. Oh, yeah. This one here, lion statue, yeah. and the other one over here is the actual eagle statue. See if we can move it. Oh. You can see its feet here. Yeah. This is its breast and its head would have yeah, been yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it was in the base of this when it was uh, being moved down the cliff there and it fell to the bottom. That from the base of it, um, there was a little hollow and that's where the cup was found. The cup that was found in the statue, it's um, quite small. In fact, when you see it... Wow, can we bring it into uh, the light? Yeah. When you actually see it, it uh, doesn't look much different to an egg cup. But God, how interesting! It was taken to the British Museum, where they identified it, and this is interesting, as a first-century Roman scent jar. No. And uh, it can't be proved that that's exactly what it was, but that's certainly the style of it. How like medieval people we still are. The power of the tale is so great that we will it to be true. But despite all the seekers, from the medievals to the Da Vinci Code, the Grail is pure myth. A symbol created by Chrétien and the poets who came after him of something that can never be possessed, but for which we must still strive. A symbol, perhaps, of the human quest itself. And the Holy Grail is not the only symbol of Arthur which was created to meet our needs. In medieval England, they thought Arthur's Camelot was Winchester. Here they have Arthur's Round Table. It's the ultimate symbol of equality among men of power, copied in parliaments round the world, in the United Nations itself. It was made for Edward I in 1290, after he'd read buried Arthur's bones in a marble tomb in Glastonbury. Well, this is the best way to view it. <laughs> I haven't been so near it for years. So it's a fake. Yeah. But of course, it's also real. Wow. Now we're up here, you can yeah. start to make out the names of the heroes, can't you? Galahad, Lancelot, Lancelot de Lac, um, Gawain. Oh, that's Gawain. That's Gawain. And then Percivale. And this is Tristram. Tristram de Lyons. Oh, yeah. Gareth, yeah. Bedivere. Yeah. Oh, and all really. the horror, you know, the, the odd ones. 200 years later, the table was repainted by another yeah. would be yeah. Arthur, Henry VIII. This was painted when? Well, it was painted in, uh, sometime just after August 1516. Yeah. Henry had come here, first visit as king, uh, saw it was in bad condition and immediately issued a writ from Southampton to repair the hall and to paint the table. <laughs> this is one of the world's greatest symbols after all, but it's changed its symbolic meaning through the centuries. So what was Henry's interest in the Arthur story? Henry wanted to be elected Holy Roman Emperor. So he has it King Arthur painted with his own face, so that this is clearly a descendant of Arthur, who rules the round table in this night. Arthur reborn. Arthur reborn. Yeah. Ready vivus. And so, Geoffrey of Monmouth's prophecy had come true. Henry VIII was a Tudor. The Tudors were Welsh. The old monarchy of Britain had been restored. And the myth of Arthur had become a parable of Britain itself, a dream of what Britain had been and could be once more, a paradise land whose golden age might still come again. But only a few years later, it was Henry himself who smashed that old world forever. When Henry fell out with the Pope and made England Protestant, 
He ordered the demolition of England's old medieval Catholic culture. And here in Glastonbury, Arthur's Isle of Avalon, they felt the full fury of the Reformation. It's like the, the Taliban in Afghanistan or the Cultural Revolution in China. And among the casualties, the bones that lay in the black marble tomb in the middle of the nave. Arthur and Guinevere, whoever they really belong to, gone forever. And with that, you might have thought the myth of Arthur had run its course. The Tudor revolution would lead us into the modern world. The age of angels and grails, gone forever. But like every nation, the British still needed their myths. Myths of identity, myths of state. Visitors come and think this is medieval, but actually it's... <laughs> well, well, they come and they, 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 they know that it represents uh, British history. But I, I... In the 19th century, the Houses of Parliament were rebuilt and decorated with the tales of Arthur and his knights. This is our legend and, and myth, which uh, Victorians thought was most appropriate. Here in her robing room, when Queen Victoria dressed for great affairs of state, she did so under the gaze of her mythic predecessor. What they wanted in this room was some kind of aesthetic which represented the merits and the virtues of kingship, of monarchy. Through Arthur, England would engage again with her lost past. For his Arthurian epic, the Victorian's favorite poet, Alfred Tennyson, joined forces with the pioneer of photography, Julia Margaret Cameron, and the same tales that had held the medieval spellbound now caught the mood of the Victorian age. The once and future king had returned. This is the original binding? Is yeah, it? original binding. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the original signature by Mrs Cameron. Oh, wow. <laughs> there's the man himself. Gosh, so these are all... And this is an original, oh. original print. What's so striking about them is mm. how how much they correspond to what our image of what the Arthurian period looks like today. I mean, well, because D.W. Griffith, the great American silent filmmaker, mm. actually was hugely influenced by Mrs. Cameron. So therefore, you actually have her sense of lighting and dress and all that going straight into early Hollywood. And there's a direct line through, from this through silent movies and onwards. Yes, yeah. they're such wonderful images, aren't they? Let's look at this. So there. Oh, oh, God, look at this. Yeah. Lancelot and Guinevere. I mean, there's a very melancholy strain oh, God, in yes, all this, yeah. isn't it? This is the height of the Victorian Empire, isn't it? How, how would you explain this? You had this undertow, as, as Arnold said, the sea of faith retreating. You've got Darwin developing the theory of evolution, not, not yet published at this point, but actually really in the air, so to speak, intellectually, this sense uh, that the, these Victorian certainties were already ebbing away just as they were at the high point. I think it's a very conscious turning one's yeah. back on what's become the modern world. Freedom fighter, Superman, Christian hero, and now head of the first British Empire. Tired giant whose noble ideals slipped through his fingers. But a figure who united the British in a mystical vision of their past. A fantasy, but somehow, like all the best myths, still true. Smoking policy is now operated in all the 
So you see this great mass of legends and stories about King Arthur grew and was added to over hundreds of years, responding to the times, to needs that were political and cultural and even emotional, psychological. And you can see too that, that most of them have no origin in real historical events. They're the product of wonderful imagination of the storytellers. And never was there seen a more doleful battle in any Christian land. And they fought all day long and never stinted till all the noble knights were laid to rest in the cold earth. And they fought till it was near night. And then King Arthur spied the traitor, Sir Mordred. And he ran towards him crying, Traitor, now is your death day come. And King Arthur smote Sir Mordred under the shield with a thrust of his spear right through his body. And when Sir Mordred felt he had his death wound, he pushed himself with his last strength up to the burr of King Arthur's spear. And he smote his father, Arthur, with his sword over the side of his head. And then Sir Mordred fell stark dead to the earth. And the noble Arthur fell in a swoon. He said, now I have my death. As he lay dying, Arthur said to Sir Bedivere, Here, take Excalibur, go with it to the lake, and throw my sword in the water. But Sir Bedivere couldn't bring himself to throw such a wonderful thing away, and twice he hid Excalibur, and came back to the king, and said he had thrown it in the water. What did you see? said Arthur. I saw nothing but the ripple of the waves, said Bedivere. Ah, traitor untrue, said King Arthur. Now you have twice betrayed me.